Coming up on this week's episode of Check Your Balances, should you get married just for the tax benefits? Those questions and more on this week's mailbag episode. Stick around. That's coming up next. Check Your Balances is a show produced and owned by Craftwork Capital. The views expressed by the hosts and their guests are personal opinions and should not be considered personal financial advice or the opinion of Kraftwerk Capital. All investments have risk and may lose money. Consult with your financial advisor, tax preparer, or attorney prior to implementing anything discussed, and please do not use this show as the sole basis for financial decisions. Welcome back to another week of Check Your Balances. I am Ross Anderson, joined as always by my friend and co-host, Dan Maseka. Good to see you, friend. Hey, what's going on? I'm in your home state right now. My nomadic journey has me in Maryland, which I'm allowed to say on our air because we are licensed here, specifically because it's your home state. Maryland's treating me pretty well. I uh, I talk a lot of smack about Maryland, but I want to give flowers where they are due. Maryland's been great to me. I am appreciating it. So thank you to you and all of the fellow Marylanders for uh, making me feel so welcome this weekend. On behalf of the great state of Maryland, I accept your uh, thanks. Yes. Yeah, no, I Dan Dan knows this and I don't think it's contentious. Maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe you get upset about it. It never seems defensive from your side, but we do have a lot of a Maryland Virginia rivalry that kind of goes on in the background. That's been true my whole life. I I don't remember if I told this story on the air or not, but my first job interview for my like big boy job after college, I was interviewed by two people. One was a Marylander and one was a Virginian. And the whole basis of our conversation was kind of just ragging on each other. And I thought that was funny and emblematic of like the true rivalry. It's like a good natured rivalry. Yeah. And then people in D.C. make fun of all of us, by the way. Right. People in D.C., they're they're basically like, yeah, quit claiming that you're a D.C. person when you're from the burbs. So they hate all of us. So it's fine. It's a it's a healthy rivalry. I think we need it. Absolutely. Dan, we're getting into a mailbag episode. It is September. It's literally September 1st that we're recording this, which I thought is kind of funny that I I don't know about you. I was super busy last week. We literally did not have time to record a podcast last week. So here we are doing it over Labor Day weekend. And um, I think hopefully we'll have a little bit of a casual fun to it. Hope everybody that's listening had a great Labor Day. If you got away with the family or whatever you were doing that you got to relax a little bit. Now you're back in the saddle. You're thinking about your money again and you're asking questions of the Check Your Balances boys. Yeah, and I appreciate everyone who sent in questions. It's really encouraging to know that people are listening and that people have been with us for years. So thanks to all of you who choose to send in emails to check your balances at outlook.com. We'll try to touch on all of them if we can as they come in. But yeah, keep it coming and certainly share the podcast with friends if you want us to keep going. Yeah, we appreciate that. So the first note we're going to touch on today came to us from Sahil. I'm going to shorten this just a little bit, but he's a fan of the show. He took advantage of the Chase $900 bonus program, which, Dan, I think you eventually got that as well. That was too juicy of an offer. I I appreciate. I feel like we helped make Sahil almost $1,000. That's our show adding real value for free. Um, But he took advantage of that Chase offer, but he did have to call them to make sure it got applied. It looks like it didn't auto apply it. And he sends his appreciation for us exposing that particular deal and encouraging him to, to take that step. I thought it was funny that he added a PS that the email was written with the assistance of chat GPT, which is funny. Chat GPT also adding real life value, except that it apparently thinks I'm Dan Marr. Yeah. I don't know who Dan Marr is. I'm going to Google it. Should I know who Dan Marr is? Hopefully, uh, hopefully not. I don't know. Um, the question that he had in here was that he wants to know what the latest is with the house situation. The house situation will be resolved this month. Now, I don't know that I'm going to record an episode in the new house this month because of when I'm closing. Uh, I'm not closing until the very end of the month, but it's going to be done. It's on schedule. I'm expecting to be in and I want to do a larger episode where we kind of tell the full story. Um, But just so you know, I'm still currently nomading. I've got a few more weeks of that. I've been very, very grateful to the folks that have let me come and, and hang out, including this room that I'm in right now, which is a nicer studio than the one I've been recording in for several years, which I very much appreciate. So that is coming. I promise the heel. Yeah, we'll do a deeper dive on on the house situation. And I do want to give kudos to your recording room. I do like the background. You've got a nice plant. You've got a guitar. It looks like some 45s in the background. That looks like a spot I'd feel comfortable in. Yeah, no, exactly. Record player back there. No, this is all good. We're, we're in a good zone. 
All right, let's get into one with a little bit more to it that we can address today. This comes to us from Alex. Alex wrote in that he recently lost his father, which we're very sorry to hear. He is in the process of getting his accounts moved over. And one of the largest of those is an inherited IRA. When the IRA was transitioned, it was cashed out. So all of the mutual fund stocks bonds were basically put in a lump sum into the money market fund. And the question is, with a blank canvas of cash, how do you deal with it? He's got short, medium-term goals. He's got longer-term stuff like retirement and really wants to see what are the high-level strategies to reinvest or kind of put together a plan for this money. Dan, I guess I'm going to start with a, a partial question. Does it change it for you that it's in cash today? The short answer is no. I feel like mentally it does because it feels like now you have to deal with where we are in the market versus had it been handed to you in mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and all that, you probably wouldn't even be asking yourself that question. So I think the fact that if you got the stocks, you wouldn't necessarily have converted it all to cash tells you that you should probably ignore the fact that it's cash now and instead turn to your own personal financial goals and make sure that it's aligned with that. Functionally, I think people don't behave that way. I think they say, look what I have now. Now I have extra responsibility to make sure I'm making a good decision with market timing. But in an ideal world, that would be a non-factor as far as the conversations that I'd be having with them. Yeah, if we're working on an inertia-based system where we're just going to deal with whatever we have, this comes up a lot when people do a 401k rollover. Because most of the time when you do a rollover, they're going to cash it out. Not because they're trying to sell the things or that they couldn't transfer them. It's just a broken system. We've talked about it a lot. 401k rollovers often show up in the form of a check. And then people go from being fully invested and maybe they were invested for decades, right? They could have been in that same account, investing dollar cost averaging, never having sold a single position. And they're left with a huge bundle of cash and they go, well, this is different. How, do, how could I possibly put all this cash in the market at one time because they're used to investing in those tiny chunks? It's kind of a dangerous spot to be in. And I actually think what, he, what he's dealing with right now is how people should think about their portfolios, right? Because we could do the same example from the other side saying, hey, I'm invested, so I don't really want to get rid of these things. Some are gains, some are at losses. We're ignoring the tax implications here because it's an IRA. But if I told you to start with a blank piece of paper, what would you do? Right. And there's a lot of times where people might be holding on to a sentimental position or something where they're going, ah, I just want to see if it comes back. What's it? Who cares at this point? And I go, if I, if I put your portfolio in cash, would you buy it again? And they go, no. That's telling. Dan, let me ask you this. Do you remember the Vanguard study about dollar cost averaging? I do. I remember the study. Last time I read the study must have been between five and 10 years ago to the point where the details I'm probably making up, but the spirit of the study, I remember. It basically said two thirds of the time dollar cost averaging is going to hurt you. Right. Right. That sounds crazy, right? Because that's how most of us are taught to invest. And the discipline of not thinking about investing, the discipline of being almost mindless about just accumulating, buying, 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 that helps so many people because they don't have to go through this same question that Alex is going through of what do I do? But dollar cost averaging, in theory, is going to hurt your performance given a lump sum of just plopping it into the market on day one. So that's an important context, is that more often than not, if we assume the market is going to go up, you want as much money in the market for it to go up. That's kind of the full stop answer. Are you going to pick the perfect day? No. And if you're thinking that that's what's going to happen, you should stop that activity immediately. Like That's not going to be how you win. It's going to be through discipline and the right process. But the other part of his question is, how do you balance a long-term versus a short-term goal? I think that's maybe the trickier part of what Alex is dealing with here, because you kind of have two separate things. You've got where we would normally align the purpose of each dollar to like a time horizon, right? So let's just cut this up into chunks. Let's assume it's $100,000 just to use a round number, and you're going to spend 10 grand of it in the next year. Okay. The right answer there is probably money market, maybe a CD, maybe a treasury bond or a T bill, right? Somewhere in the cash or cash adjacent schedule is where you need to be for something that's super short term money. If you've got some, like, maybe I'll make a down payment on a house money, in theory, that could be a little bit more aggressive if it's a couple years off. 
And then if we've got retirement money, it can likely be fairly aggressive because it's got a long time to bake, right? So you should decide how much of this money are you allocating to each of those areas of your life. And then the allocation should match that. Don't forget that part of that allocation needs to include taxes as well, because every dollar coming out is taxable. And that's the second piece is that every single time you take that distribution, because it's an inherited IRA, you're going to have to deal with the taxes. To me, if it's like a retirement dollar, right? And I'm saying, okay, this 10 grand is still going to be long-term money. I may have to take it out within the next 10 years, even though I'm not necessarily going to consume it. I don't know that I would care about aligning the taxes for cash. Because right, because that's not consumption. No, the value of the distribution is going to float. And if it goes up, I pay a little bit more in taxes. And then my net is basically the equivalent. If it goes down, same thing. I'm paying less in taxes. My net is basically the equivalent. I don't know that I would overthink that piece of it. Yeah, exactly. I, I 100% agree with that. And yeah. for long-term money, right, comes out, it's going to be reinvested anyway. We're not so concerned about the fluctuation. Rather, we care about the money that's going to be consumed in the near term be protected appropriately. One thing I just want to mention to tack on to what Ross said earlier is when I read this, rather than looking at this as a problem of, oh no, like I've got all this cash, I'm kind of hesitant to enter the market. You could flip it on its head and say, thank God I have this cash. I have some near-term and mid-term goals. I don't need to worry about selling it. Let me invest the rest of it. So it's almost like permission to have that money for consumption where it otherwise might be harder to do. And I think Ross you know, said that in his own way too. Yeah. I, I took a long time to get there, Dan. That's that's what I do here. That's my contribution to the show is adding more words. You're filling minutes, which is important. We'd have a two minute podcast if all I did was talk. <laughs> all right. Let's get into another one here. This comes to us from Scott. Uh, he asks if we've ever done a show discussing the best account types for young children. I think we've touched on this, but you know what? We're going to do it again. So here's his question in full. His oldest child is entering kindergarten. They want to get an account started where they can contribute throughout his life. The intent would be to give them a financial head start, a sense of ownership and engagement in their investing journey and access to money when they're older, say 30. I'd start small, maybe a thousand a year to get things going and already contribute to a 529 plan. I want full control and to be able to minimize any tax implications as much as possible. What does Scott need to do, Dan? Yeah, so the full control part is I think the the area that I focused on because I think the immediate inclination if you're not looking at a 529 is to go to like an UTMA or UGMA account, which is Uniform Transfer or Gift to Minors account, which gives you control until they reach a certain age, which I believe varies by state. It's 18 in almost every state. Okay, I was going to say, regardless, I don't think that age gets up to 30. They're going to be controlling whatever that account is by the time they're 18, basically. You could do a trust, right? That, right. I, that was the detail I focused on as well. And I, I tried to lay into it when I said it and read the question. If you want control until 30, you probably have very limited options in terms of when that transfer takes place. You're probably talking about a trust that would actually do that. If you want control until 18, these are very common. They're very easy to set up. But it's a fairly binary situation if you want that level of control of how and when they spend the money. Right. I mean, the other thing you can do, which is much less elegant, is just keep the money in a side account yourself and then gift it to your child at the appropriate time. Uh, The one thing that avoids as well is the potential for kitty tax. He did mention he wants it to be tax smart. So if you're transferring meaningful assets to your child and realizing income or gains, there's a threshold above which that that becomes less attractive. Yeah, if you're starting with a thousand bucks a year and you're going to be controlling the account yourself, your dividends are going to be pretty minor, right? Like until we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars, like if we assume that an average, I mean, the dividend yield on the S&P 500 is below probably what, one one and a half, one six, somewhere in that range today. Mm -hmm. So if you're talking about market linked investments, even at $10,000, your 1.6% is going to be nominal, right? 160 bucks is what you're going to deal with in dividends. And so if you're holding on to that, reinvesting it, or just letting those pay to cash, it doesn't really matter. Your exposure to the kitty tax is not super high. 
If you're talking about a hundred grand, well, now we're starting to push up against it. And if you're selling and creating capital gains, it, it it's going to be a much bigger problem. But I think for the average person that's just trying to get something started for their kids to give them a head start, I don't know that the kitty tax is where we're going to have to worry too much, especially if it's a low turnover portfolio. Right. And the other thing to think about if you're actually holding assets in your child's name is the potential for impact on financial aid. Again, I don't love imagining what college looks like in 10 or 15 years because it could be completely upside down from what we understand today. But holding assets in your own name will impact, in theory, the eligibility for aid less than if they had the assets in their name. So if that's on the table for you, that might impact how you decide to structure this. But like we said, Utma Ugma has an age implication there that might not be what you want. Trust can be expensive and complicated, but definitely gives you more control or hold the money in your own name. It's not technically theirs, but the spirit is what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. I mean, for a lot of people that would be doing something like this, I think what they're going to do is hold it in an actual separate account so they can do that mental accounting. Yeah, exactly. But you could literally buy shares of anything in your regular brokerage account and earmark it mentally. I think most people don't like that because they're going to look th- through their accounts and kind of just register their high watermark or whatever it is that they're doing to figure out how much money they have and how they're doing. They don't necessarily want co-mingling going on if they've got kind of a mental barrier there. But there's no difference if you're going to hold it in your own name of just making that gift in the future and simply just putting that money away. It's amazing what just renaming an account online can do. You could take that individual or joint brokerage account that's legally held in your name and just call it kids gift account. And every time you look at it, you're going to, you're going to assume it's theirs already. So, you know, power of it being in your face. And honestly, that's not that different. I want to make sure I don't step on it here, but in theory, if you give the money today, you buy something, all the capital gains are pushed to the child, right? When they eventually sell it, whether that's 18, 25, 30, whenever they sell that stock or that security, they're going to have to pay taxes on the gains there because you're pushing that into their situation, right? It kind of falls on your return while they're kids and while they're minors, but eventually they're going to have to deal with it. The same thing happens if you gift an appreciated stock as an adult, right? Like if you get, if I gave Dan, you know, shares of something that I bought 10 years ago, He's going to have my existing cost basis. He's going to have to pay taxes on the difference between what I bought it for and what he sells it for. It's almost no different. The only reason that you would avoid doing it that way is number one, for state reasons, like if you want it to be in the kid's name. Number two would be if for some reason, you know, you thought that there was some other risk to that money. Like, I, I, I don't know. I, to me, that seems like it's the simpler solution if you want that level of control. But again, there's, there's legal implications to all of that. I'm trying not to go too far into, into this, but you're really not offsetting the taxes by even giving the cash now. Right. Yeah, I don't want to make a blanket recommendation, but that was the solution that came to mind first for me. Yeah. Okay, I think we've got time for one more today at least. So this is one that I actually, I, I'm going to water down the premise here as much as I can. What's the least romantic reason to get married, Dan, that you can think of? I mean, money. There it is. The question that I saw that I'd like to present is, does it make sense to get married for tax purposes? Now, Full stop. I don't think this should be part of your proposal. If you're thinking about getting married, I wouldn't lead with, look how much money we're going to save. But there are actual financial considerations to getting married. And so for those reasons, if we're to wipe away everything else that's baked into that question, that's what we're going to take a look at. I just want to state for the record that I have worked with engaged couples who have asked me this specific question is, does it make sense to get married? I have two. It absolutely makes sense from an estate perspective, by the way. Yeah. Sure. So so your your ability to transfer money if something happens to you, way more powerful if you're married. All right. So ignoring that this is the worst reason to get married, let's talk about what actually happens. The example that was presented was a fairly high income gap couple 
And I think that's where this is the most interesting. So here's what we did to kind of display the situation. We've got a mock tax return set up. We have a tool that we use called Holistaplan. It's awesome. It lets us do analysis on tax returns. It lets us do pro formas, which is really what this is, where we just do like a fake one and, and kind of mock up the numbers and, and we get to test a bunch of theories. So we have a very, very simple pro forma tax return of two single people, one of whom is making $400,000 a year, the other making eighty, And then the third return is a married filing jointly return of that combined income of 480. Dan, what was your initial reaction? If you look at how much tax is being paid by these people, what did you think you were going to see here? So because of the income disparity, my assumption was filing separately was going to generate a much higher tax bill, assuming there are no other variables there. We're just looking at gross income, gross income, because you are pushing so much more income into higher brackets as a single filer. That was my assumption. Yeah. But that filing was jointly number. should save money. That was my assumption as well. Let's go through the numbers and then let's talk about where I think this would fall on it. Fall yep. fall down. Okay. So with a four hundred thousand dollar person, to simplify this, we took out everything that could be a variable here. So this assumes no 401k, or it assumes that the four hundred thousand dollars is after the 401k. Right. Okay. So those are the same thing. This is an adjusted gross income, four hundred K, a standard deduction. Right. So in 2024, for this year, your standard deduction is $14,600. Then we just looked at what the tax would be. So no other strategy, no, nothing else to mitigate, but just a straight income. We're not assuming any savings after that number that we're using. No tax deferred accounts. So again, that could either mean that the tax deferred accounts are in there, but they're above and beyond what we're looking at because this is just to equalize it. So after that $14,600 Standard deduction, this person has $385,000 of taxable income, which as a single person, that pushes them into a marginal bracket of 35%. God, that's painful. Effective rate of almost 28%. 27.8 is what it came to. So this is a person that would pay $107,000 of federal income taxes. Effective 28%, basically. That's a lot in tax. Um, That's a lot in tax, yeah. Let's talk about the other person. $80,000 income, $14,600 standard deduction. Same thing. Look at how different that standard deduction relates to the income as like a percentage basis. For one, it's a minuscule percent. For the standard deduction on a lower income, it's pretty reasonable. That gets the taxable income down to $65,400. This is a 22% bracket. This person pays an effective 144 and that's a total tax of $9,441, $9,441. So they're paying 14.5% in taxes at that income level, but the 22% marginal. Did that surprise you at all? No, but, but I'm glad it didn't surprise me because I've been working with returns like this for so long. This is what I expected. But anytime you see numbers just written out like that, it's shocking, right? That It's like $100,000 difference in taxes on income difference of 320,000. Yep. So these two people, if we add these two numbers up, which I'm going to do live on the air here. Uh, so $107,065 for the first taxpayer plus 9441 for the second. So just talking about federal income taxes, we are at 116,506. A lot of taxes. A lot of taxes. Yeah, so if we're dividing that by their combined $480,000, that's 24%. So that's what they are paying combined is an effective 24.2 if they file single with all of these things being held in place. The married filing jointly return improves it quite a bit. So $480,000 standard deduction now is $29,200. So we just combine the 14.6 for each of them. That means we've got four fifty. dollars that is taxable. We're in a 32% bracket married filing jointly and the total tax federally 101,699. Getting married, if this is your situation, saves almost $15,000 in taxes per year. Effective rate goes to 22.6, but the marginal's at 32. 
That's a bigger difference than I thought it was going to be, Dan. That's huge. I mean, $15,000. Imagine if someone just handed you $15,000, how that would feel. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a, that's, a, that's a big difference, even at this income level. Here's what I think is interesting looking at this and then what would change it. So number one, for the lower, incoming, in the lower income person in this, they are trading in their 14% tax rate for a 22% tax rate. Effective. Right. It is not good for them. As a household, this is a huge net positive. But all of that positive is really coming from bringing the higher income person's tax bracket down, which is a monster benefit. Right. You have to look at this from a household perspective. And if that's not how you're going to operate, this feels very painful for the low income earner. In my personal extended family, I've seen a situation of this where there was a marriage that took place and someone who was on the lower end of the income spectrum felt that their tax burden went up by getting married, even though it in reality went down, because I think probably what they must have done is just split the tax bill and said, here's our portion of each of it, which that doesn't feel good, even though it might have been the right decision. Yeah. If we're going to keep the proportional burden of the taxes the same, I think it's a net benefit, right? For sure. Because if you're, if you're going to say, hey, listen, I make 80000 of our combined 480 of income, I should be responsible for 16.5% of our tax burden. 16.6 is basically of the 101, 600, I think. Still more. It is still more. Yeah. That still doesn't that still doesn't equalize it. I was thinking that would equalize it, but it doesn't. Maybe we need to uh take it after the deduction standard deduction. Yeah, you might you might be right. Yeah, it might it might be the the income after standard deduction. So relate it like sixteen and a half percent of the sixty five thousand. Anyway, fifteen thousand less as a household is is what we're getting at here. Sixty five thousand of four fifty, that's the taxable income, is fourteen point four percent. Yeah, I st- I mean that's, that's still, still gonna more. be higher. Yeah, no, yep. it, I, I, I apparently either don't understand fractions or can't come up with a situation that this helps the lower incoming person. I keep calling it incoming, lower income person in this situation. That's a massive gap, but still at the household level, you're paying less in tax. Yeah. So where would this fall apart? So our, in the simplest of circumstances, high income, low income, getting married might save you meaningful amounts of dollars. Where would that not be true? Or where would you say, don't make that the reason you do this besides for just it not being very romantic? Instinctively, the housing deduction, I think, blows this up. Because here's what you could do in the first situation. Let's assume that we own a house at some point at this income level or that we're thinking about that. If we buy the house and we put that mortgage deduction under the higher earning taxpayer, and let's say we can get to $25,000, $30,000 a year of mortgage interest deduction. There's a state and local tax, which gets capped at 10 grand. So now we're deducting $45,000 for that person rather than taking that standard at 14.6. This, I think, if we, here, I'm just going to see if I can quickly refresh that and see how much that saves. So if that higher earning person had a $45,000 itemized deduction rather than taking standard that brings them down excuse me that brings them down to a 27.2 percent rate brings their total tax down to 96 grand and their marginal brackets at 35 if that married filing jointly combines and now we've got that same deduction rather than having this one as itemized and then the other one as standard my suspicion is that that's going to blow this up a little bit are you running through the math now, Ross? I'm trying to. Yeah, this is tough to do live on the air. We 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 debated on whether or not we were going to like present this as like a case study or if we were just going to like think through it. Yeah. Um, you're seeing the pain of that decision. Yeah. So I ran it through real quick. At that levels, we're not quite making up that fifteen thousand dollar difference yet. But in an extreme scenario, that clearly, if you separate those deductions out, you might be able to get there. You know, the other thing to look at are what benefits the lower income partner might be giving up if they got married. Um, In some cases, people are on reduced student loan payments on account of their income, which doesn't mean that you can't file separately uh, if you got married, but then you're in a similar situation of being single 
with potentially more restrictions because you're filing separately. Yeah, that's going to move you into basically back to the single brackets because you're filing separately and you have to both itemize or you have to both take standard. What we just described where one of you takes the optimal and the other doesn't, you cannot do if you're married filing separately. So that that breaks a lot of these strategies that we're talking about. Uh, all, all of this to think about while considering your your home life arrangement. This seems this <laughs> seems like the bad way to make the choice. It really does. So don't don't get married just for tax purposes. But if you do, it does look like it's a pretty big uh, windfall in the case of the higher earning person. Yeah, work with your accountants to find out what's right for you specifically. There are so many variables when it comes to tax, and we haven't even touched on state income tax, which can be a whole nother beast. Yeah. So. Uh, but it's, it was fun to explore anyway. I hope that people have found this helpful. I hope that we've added some enjoyment to your day as we consider all of these. If you made it to the end of us trying to do all that math, thank you so much for tuning in this week. Check your balances at Outlook.com is where you can find us. We'll catch you all next week. And, and if you haven't thrown us a rating yet, give us a nice five-star rating on Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen. That helps a ton. We appreciate all of you. 